Your next door neighbor is about to have a very, very bad day. Because that thing climbing over their roof is an ant. And it's not just any ant. It's the size of a school bus. This isn't a monster movie. This is a physics problem. And it's a problem our world would fail, spectacularly, in the first three seconds. Let's start with the most immediate issue, gravity. The universe has a cruel sense of humor called the square cube law. It's simple. When you scale something up, its volume, and therefore its weight, increases much faster than its surface area, or in this case, the cross-section of its legs. An ant's spindly legs are miracles of engineering for its size, but scale that ant up to the length of a bus, and its weight doesn't just get bigger, it multiplies exponentially. The very first bus-sized ant to exist would take one step, and with a sound like a thousand trees snapping at once, its own exoskeleton would shatter. It would collapse into a heap of chitin and goo, a victim of its own impossible size. Its six legs, biomechanically perfect for a tiny creature, wouldn't be able to support a fraction of its new, ludicrous mass. So, crisis averted, right? Our giant ant problem solves itself with a wet crunch, but that's no fun. Let's pretend for a moment that physics decides to be generous. We'll grant these new titans miraculously strong carbon fiber exoskeletons. They can now stand. They can walk. The ground shudders. And then they immediately suffocate. You see, insects don't have lungs. They breathe through a network of tiny tubes called tracheae, which open to the outside air via small holes in their body called spiracles. Oxygen just kind of diffuses in. This system is incredibly efficient for a creature that's a few millimeters long, but for a 50-foot behemoth, it's a death sentence. The oxygen could never travel deep enough or fast enough to power its massive muscles. Our giant ant would gasp for air it couldn't process and die in minutes. Okay, fine. Let's give them a pass on that too. We'll wave our science wand and install a hyper-efficient respiratory system, something nature has never conceived. So now we have them. Billions of living, breathing, bus-sized tanks marching across the globe. What happens to us? We first meet Elias, a structural engineer, on the 47th floor of a downtown skyscraper. He's looking over some blueprints when he sees it. Something impossible is emerging from the city's central park. It's long, black, and segmented. At first, he thinks it's some kind of bizarre art installation. A parade float, maybe. Then... It moves. Its antennae, each the size of a telephone pole, twitch and sweep across the sky. Another one appears beside it, and then another. It's not an invasion, it's an awakening. You might think their first move would be to attack us, to eat us, but you're thinking like a human. Ants don't hate us. They don't even notice us. We are completely and totally irrelevant to them. Their ancient, implacable instincts are now playing out on a scale that warps the very face of the planet. Their primary drive is to find food. A single colony of army ants can have over a million members. Now, imagine a million bus-sized creatures get hungry. They wouldn't bother with individual humans. They would march on our agricultural heartlands and consume entire states' worth of crops in a single afternoon. Forests would vanish, not burned but eaten, leaving behind a barren landscape of stumps and soil. The sound would be a constant planetary scale grinding. And then there's their strength. A normal ant can lift 50 times its own body weight. A bus-sized ant with our magic physics could lift an entire aircraft carrier and carry it away, but they wouldn't. They'd use that strength to do what ants do best, dig. Our cities, from their perspective, are just weirdly shaped rocks. An ant's pheromone trail is its gospel. If that trail says the quickest way to a new food source is through a building, then they will go through it, not with malice, not with anger, but with the same mindless, terrifying efficiency they use to move a pebble. From his shattered office window, Elias watches this firsthand. An ant, its black carapace blotting out the sun, approaches his building. It doesn't roar. It doesn't attack. 
It simply begins to climb, its massive tarsal claws punching through glass and steel as if they were tissue paper. It's following a path laid by a scout, a path that happens to intersect with the 34th through 58th floors. The building groans, a symphony of twisting metal and screaming support beams. Elias doesn't even have time to run. The world simply falls away. This would be an apocalypse of digging, building, and consuming. The numbers are staggering. Right now, in our world, the total biomass of all ants on Earth is estimated to be greater than the total biomass of all humans. Now, scale them up. The combined weight of this new ant population would be more than the weight of all other life on Earth combined. 10 times over, they would become the single greatest geological force on the planet. Their colonies would be the stuff of nightmares. Ant mounds, which are now just bumps in the dirt, would become mountains. They would excavate billions of tons of earth, rerouting rivers, draining lakes, and triggering earthquakes as the crust shifts under the strain of their immense projects. The Panama Canal filled in within a week. The Great Pyramids carried away piece by piece to reinforce a tunnel wall. Months later, Elias is living with a small band of survivors in the shell of an old subway station. The air is always thick with dust from the constant excavation, and the ground never stops trembling. They don't dare go to the surface during the day. The ants are most active then, their colossal shadows sliding across the ruins. The survivors' biggest fear isn't being eaten. It's formic acid. Many ants can spray this potent chemical as a defense, on a small scale, it's a mild irritant, but a bus-sized ant could hose down an entire city block with a stream of acid capable of dissolving steel and turning concrete to dust. The metallic tang of it is a constant presence in the air, a warning of the giants that now own the world. And the planet itself would begin to change. All this digging would release vast quantities of carbon and methane trapped in the soil, triggering runaway climate change on a scale we can't even imagine. The atmosphere would become thicker, hotter. As they topple forests, the planet's ability to produce oxygen would plummet. The sky itself would change color. Our weapons would be useless. You can't bomb an enemy that lives miles underground in a fortress of their own making. You can't shoot a creature whose exoskeleton is stronger than tank armor. We wouldn't lose a war against them. We'd be a footnote in their geological survey. One evening, Elias risks a trip to the surface, looking for supplies. He stands on a broken overpass and sees it. In the distance, a new mountain range pierces the hazy red sky. It's jagged, unnatural, and teeming with movement. It's an anthill a continent-sized super colony that stretches from the ruins of Denver to what used to be the Pacific Ocean. He realizes the terrifying truth. Humanity was never the target. We were just in the way. Our civilization was a fragile sandcastle built during the brief, quiet afternoon before the real owners of the world woke up. The ultimate irony is that our existence has always been dependent on theirs, just on a scale we could manage. Ants aerate more soil, disperse more seeds, and clean up more organic waste than any other group of animals. They are the tiny, unseen janitors and engineers that keep our world running. Our mistake was in thinking that the world was built for us. We were just tenants in a house that belonged to the ants all along, and the lease was up. The world wouldn't end in fire or ice. It would end with the quiet, relentless, and utterly indifferent work of six-legged giants, transforming our home back into theirs, one grain of dirt at a time.